In the video series about the Southwest Technical 6800 computer, whenever I've had to use a disk drive, I've used one of the two controllers that you see here. Up here on the left is the first controller I was using, and this is made by a company called Percom. And this was actually the first disk controller available for the Southwest Technical. It came out in the spring of 1977. Then over here on the right is Southwest's own disk controller. This came out a few months later in um, August of 77. This is the DC-1 disk controller, and it was part of what they called the MF-68 mini floppy disk system. Now, as different as these two controllers look, they really do have an awful lot in common. Uh, first of all, they both use Shugart's new five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive. Uh, they both had 35 tracks on the disk. They both were single-sided, single density. They both used 10 sectors per track, 256 bytes per sector. So their performance would be basically the same and their capacity was exactly the same. Um, only about 88K. These weren't really big by the time you did the math on them. Uh, they also both came with the exact same kind of operating system. It was basically just a clone of North Star DOS over in the 8080 and S100 world. Now it's hard to call these operating systems. It was nothing like using um, CPM or even an early MS-DOS. It was really more just a way to use the disk drive with your existing paper tape or cassette software, but not have to use paper tape or cassette. Much quicker and more reliable than using those devices. And this was not an unreasonable stepping stone when you think about it at that point, because you had already purchased basic for paper tape or cassette or maybe an editor assembler. And what you'd like to do is just be able to use that now with the disk drive to load it instead of having to wait for paper tape. So it was a logical step, even though it doesn't seem like a very good operating system, but it allowed people to use the software they already had. Now, typically these would come with a manual that tells you how to patch those to work with a disk drive. And then later on, actual versions better tuned to use the disk drive would come out. Now it's important to note that even though Southwest products now were catching up with the 8080 and S100 world by having this disk system with a North Star DOS clone, this was actually done by Northstar in the 8080 world a year earlier. And at this time in computing history, a year is a long time. A lot had changed. So by the time Southwest was technically caught up, uh, the 8080 world had already moved on. CPM was starting to catch on. And of course, CPM then opened up just an explosion of software titles. And so yet again, Southwest, was, uh, these Southwest users were still behind the curve compared to 8080 S100 world. Because yeah, CPM and lots more software was available over there by the time they were just then catching up over here in Southwest world with uh, a North Star DOS clone. Despite the similarities we discussed, of course the hardware designs were substantially different looking. If we come in here, we can see the Pertec board is in the main SS50 bus in the computer. This is where your CPU board would be and your RAM cards. I have the RAM cards out so we can get a better view of the board. The board occupies a 4K block of memory from C1000 through D1000. The first 3K of that is allocated to these three EEPROM sockets, each which would hold a 2708, which are 1K apiece. The last uh, 1K of the memory space was actually the memory mapped I.O. that allowed you software to run the card and do the disk, the disk controller functions. Now the operating system on this Percom was supplied on EEPROM. These two EEPROMs comprise the MPX operating system. That's the North Star DOS clone that Percom supplied. Seems kind of unusual to have operating system on EEPROM, typically think of it as booting off a disk. But in this early transitionary stage of computing, this really wasn't a bad idea. You think about it, hardware wasn't real reliable, software wasn't real reliable. It wasn't hard for things to run away and clobber the operating system if it was in RAM. And of course, possibly clobber the content of disk as well. And then your boot disk doesn't work. So having this on EEPROM just meant you could always hit reset and be running again. Your disk was truly just data. You didn't have to worry about clobbering your, your last boot disk or anything like that. So really not too bad an idea. All right, uh, this controller was a hard sector controller, not soft sector. Don't let this big chip fool you. This is not a floppy disk controller. That's actually a, a USART used to serialize and deserialize the data coming to and from the disk service. Now, if we look at the Southwest controller, it's back here in the SS30 bus, the IO bus. Now this is a soft sector controller. They chose to go with the brand new at the time, um, 
1771 floppy disk controller made by Western Digital. And this chip made a world of difference in how easy it was to create a soft sector controller. In fact, as you can see, it's actually simpler now than a hard sector controller. With this chip and its descendants, totally revolutionized floppy disk in uh, microcomputer world. And after this time period, hard sector controllers pretty much just slowly disappeared um, from the face and everything went soft sector from then on. All right, so back here in the IO4 bus, excuse me, in the SS30 bus, each slot takes up uh, four address, four memory locations or four address locations. But this board needed five to address the four registers in the 1771 and then a drive select register on the board. So this blue wire here is an example of what would have been done. You actually take over uh, the driver, excuse me, the select lines from that slot right next to it. It's in slot, what slot are we in? We're in slot six. It takes over the select lines from slot five in order to fully address the disk controller. So even though it physically took one slot, it uh, electrically ended up taking up two slots out of that back bus. All right, so in this configuration, you did boot off of disk. The operating system loaded from the disk into RAM, but how would you boot the disk to begin with because we can't have EEPROM back here on the IO bus? Well, to solve this problem, Southwest Technical introduced a new ROM for the main CPU board. Originally, it was Motorola's MicBug. With the introduction of this disk controller, the MF68 disk system, in August of 77, they also released Swapbug, which you've heard me say a hundred times. So one of the main reasons for Swapbug was to add disk support for their new disk system. Of course, they added some other you know, new functions and features as well, but it was um, primarily to get this disk system up and running, and that's when it was released, was to make this um, disk controller work. All right, so that's a good introduction to those two boards. If you want to see those boards in action and see more about them, I put a link to the playlist for the Southwest Technical and the information below the video. You can watch those when you want and learn more about these two. Um, but for now, we're going to move on and take a look at a new board that we haven't used yet in any of these videos. The third disc controller we're going to look at today is one that has not been in any of my videos so far. It is this BFD-68 made by a company called Smoke Signal Broadcasting. This came out in December of 1977, about four months after Southwest introduced their disk system. Um, Smoke Signal had made a name for itself over the preceding year with a 16K RAM board that they made for the Southwest computer, and it was a big success. And with that success, they decided to make this disk subsystem for the Southwest as well. And in the end, this was a very successful product for them as well, um, selling about as well as Southwest's own disk system did. And with that success, Smoke Signal went on to make some of their own computer products, 6800 and 6809, um, actual computer systems, over the next few years. All right, so now this board, you might wonder how did it achieve su such success in the market? How did it compete? Um, like most new products, they came in with a bit lower price. That always gets your foot in the door. And they had a good reputation for their 16K board, so people didn't think it was junk. They knew it was a good company to work with, and it was lower price, so that was attractive. And when it came to uh, the disk controller itself, it could advertise that it had better data reliability than the Southwest board did. And we'll address that in just a minute. But probably the thing that made the biggest difference was actually software. This did not ship with yet another North Star DOS, DOS clone, um, instead, it shipped with something they called DOS 68, which is a lot more like CPM or the Flex operating system that you've seen me demonstrate in other videos. Now, this is actually coming out five or six months before Flex 1.0 was introduced. So this was ahead of Flex in terms of the Southwest Technical and 6800 um, history. In fact, it appears based on the similarities that Flex may have borrowed some ideas from DOS 68. Still digging into that history, trying to make sure I understand it fully. So one of the things here that made this popular is that it had more of a real operating system and they included real utilities, uh, editor, assembler, good version of basic, working with other companies to make software that ran under this operating system and as was designed to run under it instead of just patching a um, paper tape version or a cassette version. So it had a much more turnkey professional feel to the whole system and to the software. 
And then that, I think, is one of the main reasons this was able to succeed. Now, Southwest Technical, Flex would come out for that around the May of 78 timeframe, again, four or five months later. So at that point, Southwest began offering a similar environment to this DOS 68 and eventually a bit better than DOS 68. So that's kind of how that timeline works. Like the PERCOM board, this board from Smoke Signals is in the main SS50 bus, as you can see here. It also has non-volatile storage on the board for some code. Instead of an EEPROM, this is a ROM, 512 byte ROM. It does not include the entire operating system. It just includes code to boot the operating system off a of disk, and it also includes sector read-write routines that the operating system or another program could call if they needed to. Now, unlike the PERCOM, this is not a hard sector controller. This is a soft sector controller. Here's the Western Digital 1771 like is used back here on the, uh, on the Southwest Technical Board. Now, one thing that's interesting is they used what's called an external data separator um, for the 1771. What that means is that external circuitry decodes the data coming from the disk into separate clock and data pulses. And that improves the reliability of this board over Southwest's own board, which used the internal data separator inside the 1771. What's interesting is that in the Western Digital's own data sheet for the 1771, it basically said, hey, the internal separator is not that good. You should probably use an external one. Um, a few quick experiments, and it seems to work just fine without an external one, and that might be why Southwest went ahead and went that route. But when you get outside the normal distribution curve, let's say, towards the edges one way or the other, based on particular disk drive or particular media, you are going to run into situations where the, the bit crowding that occurred in the inner tracks of a disk were problematic for that internal separator. And so, yes, the uh, smoke signals could advertise that it, it was more reliable than the, the uh, Southwest technical system would be, especially on the inner tracks of a disk. All right, the other thing that's very interesting about this board is that it's basically invisible to the rest of the system. It does not use up any address space that normal hardware can see or software can see, nor does it use any I.O. slots in the back either. It did this trick by interleaving itself inside the I.O. space of the Southwest Technical Computer. Now, if you remember, the I.O. space in this computer is pre-decoded on the bus, and it's uh, a fixed 8K block from 8000 through 9FFF. These chips you see down here beside, behind the controller decode that range, 8000 through 9FF, to pre-decode these eight slots. And those eight slots actually represent just uh, four bytes each. So a total of 32 bytes are decoded. And yet they allocated a full 2K to it, um, excuse me, 8K to it, uh, from again, 8,000 through BFF. So as you might expect, those 20 hex bytes, 32 bytes, repeat over and over in that 8K block from 8,000 to 9 FF. However, the trick is that it does not repeat every single 20 hex bytes, it repeats every other 20 hex bytes. So for example, the IO space occurs, is visible, and is typically accessed from 8000 through 801F, and then you'd expect it to repeat at 8020, but it doesn't. 8020 through 8030F, nothing responds at all. The IO space repeats again at 8040 through 805F. Then at 8060 through 807F, nothing responds at all. IO space again appears at 8080, on and on and on. So every other 20 hex bytes in this 8K block aren't addressed by anything. And so that is where this ROM shows up. It shows up in between um, those 20, byte, 20 hex bytes where the IO space is actually decoded. Now you might think that makes for a pretty convoluted, messed up looking set of code inside that EEPROM, but in reality, most of the routines are less than 32 bytes it's only the actual read and write routine that has to jump from page to page. And even that's just two jumps. It's really not as ugly a set of code as you would think being broken up like that. In fact, it's cleaner and more logical than the layout of Swatbug, which is very convoluted because they were trying to keep a lot of the common entry points that were used in MicBug. They were trying to keep those in Swatbug and add the new features. So Swatbug could be pretty in, um, ugly. Um, the actual I.O. space that controls the disk controller, that's also hidden in one of those 20 hex byte long invisible spots. 
So pretty cool, this board uses absolutely no resources from the system and yet provides full controller features and also has a ROM in it. So pretty neat uh, solution to that problem. All right, so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and uh, do a video cut. We're gonna just boot up DOS 68 real quick so you can see it. Um, but after that, we're just gonna end this video and we'll do a full demonstration of DOS 68 in the next video. All right, so let's go ahead and get DOS 68 up and running and insert the disk. I've already reset the computer. I'll just go ahead and do it again. All right, and now we're up and running swap boat as you always would be using uh, this Southwest computer. Now again, the IO space starts at 8,000 and this is every other 20 hex bytes. So the first byte of this EEPROM or PROM, ROM I should say, is 8020. And that's also, also the boot location. So if I jump to 8020, you'll hear this disk drive take off and it'll start booting. All right, so DOS is now up and running, and now it's out getting a, um, a startup file, a lot like an autoexec.bat file. And it's loading and running a, a program called set to set some serial port parameters. And it loaded a print driver into memory. And this is just a comment telling us we're ready. So the prompt on DOS is that DOS colon. Um, let's just do a quick directory. The directory command is called list. And uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is it actually lists your files first. That would be like your files. I can pause the screen here. Um, and then below that, it lists all the other files that are considered commands um, that make up DOS 68's functionality itself. And those all have an extension of dollar sign. All right, well, that's it for this video. We'll go ahead and boot DOS and learn more about it in the next video. Again, if you want to learn more about these controllers uh, that we showed in the beginning, I put a playlist link under the video and then uh, that playlist will eventually include all the videos that talk about this new smoke signal controller as well.